Welcome to a brand new episode of Cup of EO, the tea break size podcast that gets to the heart of the important topics in the world of voiceover. Expect candid stories, top tips and sage advice as I chat with expert guests who are at the top of their game in the voiceover industry. I'm your host, Kimberly Parker, tea addict and VOpreneur. And this week, I'll be spilling the tea on live sessions, including some interesting stories and tips on how to get the most out of one. Yeah, well, we had quite a laugh at times because certain phrases in the game I had to translate on the spot. Live sessions can be anxiety-inducing for even the most seasoned pros. And whether you're in person or remote, they're a bit of a double-edged sword. On one hand, they're a blessing. You've got the client there, you can capture everything they want in the session, and they can react in real time. Hopefully, you've also got a producer to manage the session and prevent chaos breaking out. And if it's a remote session and you're really lucky, you'll have a sound engineer too. So you'll only have to worry about your performance. On the other hand, you occasionally get live sessions with 11 people dialing in, some of whom have never worked with VOs before, so don't know how to direct or even how to communicate what they want. The script is changing several times during the session, everyone is asking contradictory things of you and no one seems to know who's in charge. That's only happened to me a couple of times, thank goodness, but it's only when you're in the session that you know what kind it's going to be. I think the time I was asked to impersonate both a hamster and a pirate to yawn and sneeze, perform some rather questionable sound effects and make up a jingle on the spot and sing it, all in the same session, will take some beating though. None of which, by the way, was in the script. I wanted to find out how my fellow VOs prepare for live sessions in their home studios. If they have any embarrassing or funny live session stories, perhaps more for schadenfreude than anything else, as well as any tips on how to make sure that they go smoothly. This week's guests are Mike Bodie, Lizzie Jobling, Mars Lepowski, Claire Reeves and Sam Boffin. I've included more information about all of them in the show notes, so be sure to check those out after the episode. Finally got down on my to-do list of creating a two-channel setup in my booth because post-pandemic, oh sorry, in the middle of the pandemic, everybody bought bought booths and they bought equipment to be able to do voiceover from home. Not everybody knew what they were doing, and so when you when you tell an engineer or a, a full-on stu- a permanent professional studio that you go, oh, I've got a home setup, that's such a broad term for what you might have. You might have a duvet over your head and a blue Yeti in your closet. And it's like, that's okay. That might be fine for like super low end jobs where you just want like a local mom and pop store to be like, on Thursdays, we've got rum cake and a bit of tea. Come round to my store. It will be nice. (laughs) It's like, yeah. And it's like, maybe for that store, that, that blue Yeti thing is, uh, is fine. But like, if you're going to be doing a national TV commercial, your blue yeti and a duvet is not going to cover it. Um, so I, I always had the philosophy with booth equipment is that there's so many reasons why we don't get a job in voiceover and, and other acting fields, and your equipment should never be a reason. That if I if I rock up going, look, I've got the limited edition Ferrari Bugatti hybrid crossbreed of which there is only one kind in the world equivalent of a booth, and somebody goes, hey, thanks, we went with somebody else, I know that it's not my kit. I know it's something that I did. And that's and if it's something that I did, that's something I can work on. And that's something I can get better at. Whereas if I go, oh, yeah, the uh, I've got a bit of a shoddy XLR cable and the, and the connection's a bit kind of janky, then, and, and, and if I listen to the, and if, I'm, if I don't know what I'm listening to when I'm recording something, and if an engineer goes, oh, there's a bit of buzz in that, mate. Can you get rid of that? And I go, oh, no, sorry, I've got a janky XLR cable and I'll get paid till next month, so I can't buy a new one. It's like, right, we're recording tomorrow. Um, it's not going to work. And that's a situation that I never wanted to be in. So I always made sure to get absolutely top of the line, everything, go over the top, over-engineer everything, so that if somebody it thries, tries to throw me a curveball, I can go, ah, I got you. No, I'm covered for that. Oh, I've had loads. I've had loads. I've had loads that go wrong. I hate 
live directed sessions, I still get really nervous. I think that's probably when that's when the imposter syndrome comes out and it's like, you're just a social worker. What are you doing in this booth recording? Um, I hate it. I mean, I've got regular like clients who I'm very comfortable with and used to now and we have a nice little chit chat. I don't mind those. But it's where you get the big jobs and you've got like, you can tell there's 15 people sat around some boardroom table all chiming in. I had a client and uh, the company that got me the job and the client and they would always come on together. And it was always quite a chunky script, right? And the client would insist on reading the whole script how he, in inverted commas, wanted it delivered. But it it was almost comical because he'd be like, and today we are going to... And this is how he spoke, right? So he'd deliver this whole script. So I'd sit there for about, I don't know, 15 minutes while he reads this script in this like really monotone voice. and. And I'd be sitting there thinking, one day I'm just going to start voicing it back like that. (laughs) Um, And I and I just keep thinking, I'm I'm so glad they can't see my face Um, because I'm just sitting there like, what is going on? So that that's always quite amusing. But I think the the worst one was I hadn't been in the industry long, and I got well, I thought I got a job for FIFA for their TV ad uh, for a new game, and I was like, what a gig to have got. And I was like, this is brilliant. And I got it through this company that used to do book me for quite a lot, actually. And, um, yeah, it was for FIFA. So I've got, it it was literally about 15 people. So the company that got me the job, there were three of them. The director and his mate, whoever that was, the actual client um, and loads of other people. And so the client comes on and says, right, have you had the video? And I was like, no, because I hadn't. So anyway, they pinged it over in the live chat, which is always fun, isn't it? Then I started doing my first read and I got interrupted by one of the many people there. And they sort of said, oh, um, actually, this is the reference for you. And it was like, and I'm not lying, it was a 14-year-old boy, right? And I was sat there like, I don't think they meant to give me this job. But then it was it was very clear that the, the guys that got me the job had obviously not done something they should have done. So, but then they started trying to sort of blame me. This is all on the call, right? And they're like, well, yeah, but on your reel here, you've done this thing for Nickelodeon and we just want it to sound like that. And I was like, I can sound like that, but I cannot sound like a 14-year-old boy. Like, I just, I can't do that. So I did learn from that, always to say to the client, have you got a reference video? Have you got a reference VO? Just can we clarify that we're all on the same page? And I've had many a time where I've not hit record, which is always embarrassing. I've come to the end of the session, it's like, oh, really sorry, now that we got the 57th take right, could we just bash another one out because I haven't been recording? <laughs> I, always, I always go back to Call of Duty because it was the most significant, the most uh, among all those recent ones. Yeah, well, we had quite a laugh at times because certain phrases in the game I had to translate on the spot. And their translation, or the translation Activision provided, was not exactly, uh, how to put it, right. And in many cases, they asked me to, to do the translation because there was like English text in the brackets, which was supposed to be translated by me. But certain, certain texts that was, or scripts that was already translated were wrong. So I had to explain them why it is wrong, and because you know, uh, Slavic languages have completely different grammatics, you know, against uh, uh, Germanic languages. And thus, it was very funny in many cases. I do remember, I mean, in general, the first time I started doing sort of live sessions from my home studio. And my studio, like everybody else's who's been doing this a while, has evolved. Um, And I do remember just feeling incredibly paranoid that in the early days, I've been full-time voiceover for the last 13 years. Um, In the early couple of years, my studio sounded all right, but my goodness, did it look a state. We're talking chipboard, we're talking duvets, nailed to things, we're talking a corner of a house, and we're talking a very small toddler 
as well that I was supposed to be looking after full time. Um, so I guess my biggest challenges were occupying a one year old whilst also pretending that I was a dedicated well, pretending I was a dedicated voiceover, but I was trying to do both so hard at the time. Um, you know, it's fine now. He's 12 and at school and actually pretty happy occupying himself. I like to think that my voiceover career has enabled him to occupy himself. But I would have to sit my son if I had a live session in another bedroom surrounded in duvets so he didn't go anywhere um, with a few uh, cheese cubes and breadsticks. Yeah, so I mean, I guess live sessions, people would assume, I I don't know, I was always really worried that I didn't have the right tech because I didn't have ISDN back then. Um, And I just felt like Skype and phone, someone saying, have you got a phone patch? I'd be like, yeah, of course I have. And it'd be like my mobile phone with one of my headphones in my ear. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors in the early days. And I think that's all right, as long as nothing goes wrong. Um, Live session stuff, I suppose the first time I was directed by a load of people, we're talking a massive, massive client. And, you know, the the longer you're on the call, the more people that you see appearing um, and you know, this was before Zoom and things. I think there was Skype, but then people would patch in other people to their calls. And I think at one point I ended up with about 12 people on this call and everyone's got an opinion, haven't they? And I don't know why they think that's a good idea. You know, really, it's it muddies the situation. But, you know, knock yourself out if you want to be there. I don't mind. But I did realise that there were sort of more and more people than I could count at one point, And it was a really big client. We're talking a very big social media person. Um, <laughs> um, I'd love to tell you more. Um, but that was, I mean, it was okay. I was, I was just a bit preoccupied with the tech around me, with having a small child, with them probably thinking I had a studio like I have now, glossy. But you know, uh, is there an element of thinking you're going to be found out all the time? Yes, probably. Yeah. And do we still feel that all these years on sometimes? I must have directed literally hundreds, thousands of voices over the time that I worked at the BBC. And um, so we had all kinds of people coming into the booth. And often quite, ta- you know, famous people. So I'm not going to mention any names, but there was there was certainly one person in particular who he used to turn up, he used to do the script, um, and then you'd try and direct. You'd say, oh, um, are we wondering... And he would literally stop and go, no, that's what I do. I've, I've done. I've done what I do. Um, that's, that's the way I'm going to do it. And so he would not, he literally would not be directed. He would he would do it once, he would do the taglines, and then he'd basically say, right, I'm off now, thanks, love. And it was, nobody could direct him. He was extraordinary. And so we only ever, eventually, obviously, we only ever, um, we only ever used him if the client absolutely asked for him. Uh, but otherwise, it was an absolute no-no, because it, it was a nightmare. You couldn't get the right you know, you, you couldn't get the right timing or anything. It was just a nightmare. And then <laughs> there was also one guy who we did use frequently uh, who would go through his whole repertoire of funny gags and voices whilst in the booth, whilst warming up. And it took... We, we would have to add on, inst- instead of it being... Cause we used to have an hour's session that we didn't use. We'd have to, you know, record and mix down and do everything, you know, numerous... Um, uh, you know, numerous different takes in in an hour session. So we kind of wanted about 20 minutes of voiceover, if that. And we would have to add an extra half hour on if we were booking him because he literally, it didn't matter who you were because he never remembered if he'd worked with you before. But he, he was, he literally would go through his entire repertoire of funny gags, funny voices, the lot. It was like some crazy, enormous audition every time. Then he'd do what you asked him to do. But he was incredibly good, and so we did book him a lot. But we'd have to we'd have to make the session longer because of it. So those two things actually made me determined as a voiceover to come. You know, if you if you come into a live session, by all means say hello, 
definitely remember and ask for the engineer's name. Very important to know who the engineer is, as well as your director. Those are the two linchpins. But not waste their time. Some great stories and tips there on what to do and not do during live sessions. Being memorable for the wrong reasons really isn't what you're going for. So simple things like, as Sam mentioned, make sure you get everyone's names. Don't take up too much time with chit chat, as well as making sure your home studio setup is working and up to scratch. Some things I've learned along the way is setting expectations before the session. So, for example, if you're recording from your home studio and you're not able to play back during the session and there isn't an engineer booked, let your client know in advance. Because you don't want the unnecessary embarrassment of telling your client in the session that you can't do something. If all else fails, equipment included, be professional and most of all, be nice. Join me same time next week when I'll be spilling the tea on marketing for voiceover. How much should we be doing and where to begin? Everything that Microsoft do, you have to do on a on a minute scale. There are a lot of VOs out there and I think branding is very useful to be able to kind of differentiate you from other people. It's a language that everybody speaks. Unless you speak for your art, your art doesn't. Because there is now so much stuff going on you have to be the one to speak for it whether you're getting clicks on your website or not you need it there you need to have that that bit of magic that's going to set you apart thanks for tuning in my caffeinated comrades if this episode has sparked any questions or comments or you just want to connect you can find my email address and social handles at kimberlyparker.com if you haven't caught up with my other episodes feel free to check them out and let me know what you think You've been listening to Cup of VO. Until next time, 